project um, researching experiences of grief, trying to capture features that may be common to many or all experiences of grief, while also attempting to do justice to the complexity and diversity of people's grief experiences, both at a time and over time. So obviously when presented with a conference on the situated brain, I'm going to ask the question, what can we learn about experiences of grief by studying the brain? And I don't want to answer that question. Um, instead, what I want to do is sketch a conception of grief which constrains the kinds of questions we can sensibly ask about grief and the brain. Now, as I remarked at the workshop as well, there's been, to my mind at least, surprisingly little work done um, on specifically grief and the brain. So I did lots of Google searches and couldn't dig up, dig up much at all. And even people who do reviews of the literature offer remarks such as the neurobiology of grief is still in its infancy. And that's not an explanation for a paucity of work on the topic because you can say, yes, there isn't much work on it because it's in its infancy, but then why on earth is it in its infancy when you type in depression in the brain by comparison and you're absolutely overwhelmed? much cited sources. Um, now in light of the sparse literature you might think why bother but I think we can do something more more interesting here by reflecting on the kinds of questions that we can sensibly ask about grief in the brain we can also draw attention to much larger methodological issues and I think I'll maybe just give you a historical well just a sort of personal anecdote um, to, to give you some context for this. I've been thinking about the topic of grief for a long time in relation to various other themes, uh, bereavement, hallucinations, trauma, and initially how we distinguish depression from grief phenomenologically, if indeed we do. And back in 2011, when I was thinking about that, I was having a chat with the philosopher Peter Goldie um, outside a bar in Durham City, and we were talking about our shared interest in emotion and more specifically the way in which our attention had been turning to grief. And Peter said to me what he'd love to do in the years to come was take grief as an exemplar, a paradigm, a lens for thinking about our emotional lives more generally and just see how our conception of emotion changes as a result. Um, and sadly Peter died not long after that and so all that remains are his initial investigations into the narrative structure of grief. But as my own work on this topic has gone on, I've increasingly gravitated towards that question. And I suppose followed Peter's lead and offered my own version of that project. And I think this is what we get more generally when we explore grief. Our view of human emotional life begins to shift. In the process, so do the more specific questions we might ask about the relationships between grief and the brain. And let me just tell you what I'm going to say and what follows so you don't have to listen to any of it and you can just play on Twitter and then ask questions afterwards anyway. One important aspect of grief is that it's not an emotional episode and it's not a longer term mood or atmosphere or feeling. And an awful lot of the literature on emotion in various disciplines has emphasized specific episodes that fit into neat categories so-and-so is experiencing fear of the dog, uh, anger at the bad driver, and so on. So there's a focus on episodes, and if you get bored of episodes, you turn to moods. But grief doesn't seem to be an emotional episode, or a mood, or a feeling, or an atmosphere. If you look at most accounts of grief, it's cast as a temporally extended process of some form. So maybe to understand emotional life, we need to look at longer-term process structures rather than states or episodes. And when we do this, what I'm going to show briefly is that we start to see two other important things. The process structure of grief depends in all sorts of ways on how one interacts with other people and with the wider social world. It's not something that one can think of in terms of processes internal to the individual that somehow exude exogenously and are then expressed socially. And another thing that I'm increasingly moving towards is that we start to take the emphasis away 
from neatly categorized episodes. So much of our everyday talk and writing about human emotional life, about experience, is about patterns of unfolding, which are experienced dynamically. We experience how one emotion flows into another, how an inchoate emotion crystallizes into something more specific, how some horrible truth about ourselves dawns from an inchoate emotion that was lurking in the background. Sometimes we recognize the truth about something, but it takes time to sink in emotionally. And something that you find when you start looking for it is all the references to emotional haunting in people's lives. People talk about emotional haunting all over the place, as if there's stuff lurking in the background, like some kind of praying animal, preparing to jump out at any moment and um, sabotage your future by reminding you of something about your past. So when you look at grief, you start to see this dynamic structure. But if you wanted to focus on emotional episodes and start putting people in scanners and trying to find the neural correlates of that, those episodes and say that that tells us all about grief, what you could say is, well, yes, it might take the form of a process, but that process is reducible to its parts. So we can understand grief by studying its parts, and when we talk about the neurobiology of those parts, we're talking about the neurobiology of grief. Nothing more to be said. Get lost philosophy. You're out of a job here, at least. Um, but I think there's a real worry here. A grief process can encompass all manner of different experiences. You might try and say that some of them are inessential to grief, but then when you start taking them away one by one and saying, well, I don't think that's essential, I don't think that's essential, there's nothing left. And most, or maybe even all, of the constituents of a grief process are common to a range of other emotional processes as well. So if you want to say something interesting about grief specifically, you want it to be contrastive, you want it to be about grief, uh, rather than sitting in the cinema watching John Wick 4 or something. You want it to be about grief rather than a host of other experiences that occur in a host of different contexts. And if all you're finding are constituents of grief that can equally feature in all sorts of other experiences, you're not going to get very far. So there's a really important methodological issue here. Can a grief process be broken down to the sum of its parts, or is it holistic? Is it irreducible? And my answer is the latter. So to see why, um, we can turn, as many people do, to, to Wittgenstein, who in his philosophical investigations is scratching his head about this amongst several hundred other things, and says, hang on, you know, for a second he felt violent pain. That makes sense. Why does it sound odd to say, for a second he felt deep grief? Only because it so seldom happens. And what Wittgenstein's getting at is it's not just that momentary grief is unusual. It's somehow incoherent. If we try to conceive of someone suffering profound grief for a second, and then just switching off that grief, carrying on as usual, everything's fine, nothing's changed, nothing's repressed, nothing's delayed, nothing's avoided, life as usual. Someone's died, momentary profound grief, oh, that's gone, well, let's get on with things. Why does that not make sense? Well, Wittgenstein doesn't tell us because he never tells us anything. He just leaves us wondering about this, which has led to this burgeoning, um, <laughs> conflicting literature in Wittgenstein's scholarship, which I just can't bear to get into properly. Um, but he does at least indicate that grief, grieving now is akin to playing chess now. And you can play chess just for a moment. But if you were to play only momentary chess, you only ever move pieces, you never complete a game, you never engage in a game properly, you wouldn't be playing chess at all because your behavior wouldn't be sensitive to the norms that are constitutive of chess. Now, grief doesn't have strict norms as chess does, but this still gives us a clue. A grief process does something and it hangs together in virtue of what it does. So, grief isn't just an emotional feeling or set of feelings that we experience in response to a death. Grief is a wide-ranging emotional engagement with the fact of someone's death. And I think what's often neglected when people think about grief or try to understand the experiences of grief is the sheer extent to which and the many different ways in which another person can be incorporated into the structure of our lives. When somebody dies, 
All sorts of aspects of our lives are rendered untenable. All manner of habits, pastimes, projects that are integrated with other projects, a host of habitual expectations. All of this can be rendered non-viable. And something rather peculiar happens where the world may appear just as it did before. One's habitual patterns of thought may be as they were before. One embarks upon various patterns of habitual activities. You enter the home, the home after returning from the hospital where the person you live with has died. That's still their room. That's the sofa where we sat. Might be their toys, their book collection, their place at the breakfast table, our car, the cafe where we used to go every weekend. And recognizing that this whole structure, this whole life structure, this way of relating to other people and to one's world as a whole has to change is not just a matter of adjusting however many propositional beliefs. It would be better to conceive of it in terms of one's experiential world. Another person is written into the world that we take for granted in so many different ways. The world in which we think, the world in which we encounter others, the world in which we experience ourselves for the most part. So how is that? Well, let me just give you a very brief schematic account. So, you know, at the moment, I'm sitting in a room, and I don't just see some bare, objective, neutral manifold. I see a room that is patterned in various ways. And my experience is organized in part by the ways in which things, and of course, people matter. You all matter to me. You're significant in certain ways, which is why I wouldn't start picking my nose right now. Of course, I wouldn't do it anyway. Um, but the people, the chairs, the screen here, the microphone, the tatty papers I've scribbled on in front of me, the bottle of water, all of these things appear significant to me in various ways. They're relevant, salient, maybe illicit activities or obfuscate activities. They're significant in a range of different ways. But the manner in which they're significant is holistic and largely coherent. It all knits together as a generally coherent web that we take for granted. And our surroundings are imbued with these significant possibilities. Now, all of that presupposes, if you like, a life structure, or what's sometimes called a practical identity. If I'd never encountered academia in my life before, if all I did was, I don't know, surf, and then you drop me at the front of this room, I wouldn't only be feeling bewildered and bemused, things would look different, the room would be organized differently, things wouldn't stand out in the same ways. Regardless of my level of propositional understanding, the world would be differently organized. So the ways in which things are significant reflect our projects, our values, our commitments, our entrenched habits, our pastimes. The world is flooded with these various expectations. And when someone dies, depending upon the relationship you have with them, that can be profoundly affected in all manner of ways. So grief doesn't just involve coming to terms with something propositionally, adjusting one's thoughts. Grief involves reconciling an explicit belief with a world that for a time can remain utterly at odds with that belief. So the, the philosopher Rupert Reid, for example, has suggested that grief has a kind of logic to it, but it's a temporal logic. It's a logic where your expectations are constantly negated and adjusted over time to reconcile this belief with the world in which it arises. And this is also why Thomas Attig refers to grief as relearning the world. And I've argued in various sources that what unifies the many different constituents of grief, what renders them a coherent whole, is that they together contribute to the process whereby our world comes to accommodate, and at least to some extent, um, uh, accommodate uh, sorry, accommodate to some extent the reality of the death. And this is why grieving for a moment and then simply stopping just doesn't make sense. You can't grieve for a moment and stop without leaving something undone. That's why it's incoherent. You have to engage with the world over a period of time. There's no other way in which this can be accomplished. And this, 
is why it just isn't a very good idea to try and study grief in a static way. Let's look at what's going on in the head of someone who's grieving and then try and find the neural correlates of grief. So there are studies, for example, that involve uh, a so-called grief eliciting paradigm where you show people photographs and words um, that involve the person who's died versus neutral conditions where you just show them random stimuli and then you say, oh look, what's going on in the brain here and what's going on in the brain there? But if grief is a temporarily extended structured process, what's going on there isn't grief. It's perhaps a constituent of grief, but it could be a constituent of lots of other things as well. And you find this in other studies as well. So a recent one that I did manage to dig up takes grief to be an unwanted and unpleasant feeling. Well, that leaves something to be desired, but then refers to activation of the grief neurological pathway. Well, sorry, there's no such thing. It just doesn't even make sense to talk in those terms, and you see that when you've conceptualized grief in a remotely adequate way. Other studies use a technique which is more usually known as changing the subject. <laughs> so what you'll do is say that you've discovered something really interesting about grief, but then you'll say, well, of course, grief involves profound sadness, and then you'll rattle on about the neurobiology of profound sadness and hope people won't notice that you've switched the cards. So this doesn't really work. And I'm not suggesting everybody who talks about grief and the brain does this, but I'm suggesting that it's not infrequent in the small literature that I have managed to dig out. There are other problems here as well. I mean, I've focused on, if you like, as what Attic calls relearning the world, but that's not all there is to grief. When we think about grief specifically in relation to the death of a person, we are also concerned with them, not just with our own world, not with what's happened to us, but with what's happened to them, our relationship with them, not just our own loss of possibilities, but their profound loss of possibilities, the extinction of their possibilities, the unfathomability of that. So there's the personal aspect of grief, our concern for the person who's died, and we need to look at that as well. But this poses a methodological problem because the need to relearn a world is absolutely central to bereavement grief, but it's not specific to bereavement. We find very similar forms of experience in a range of contexts, including illness, injury, impairment, grief over psychiatric conditions as well, unemployment, homelessness, relationship breaks up, breakups, migration, cultural upheaval, loss of possibilities with age, all of which can undermine one's life in ways that are structurally similar. And indeed, if you look at the way the term grief is used, sometimes it's conceived of specifically as a response to bereavement. But we also talk of grief in all sorts of other circumstances. Grief over all those lost possibilities during the pandemic, those precious life moments that will never be recovered. Grief over the children we never had, we were never able to have. Grief over the place we can never return to. Grief over the person they were before the accident. Grief over the person one used to be and no longer is, perhaps following traumatic events. So a host of circumstances can undermine our world in ways that are variably similar. Of course, experiences of bereavement grief can be very different from each other. All these other experiences can be very different from each other, and the overlap varies. So what it comes down to is that the referent of the term grief is unstable, and it's often not clear what we're studying. For example, there's one, um, I think, fairly widely cited study that, rather than looking at grief over the death of a person, takes grief over the death of a pet as equivalent and then speculates about the neurobiology of grief here and just says, well, it's going to be the same thing when you lose a person you love. I don't want to belittle pet grief, but pet grief isn't unitary. It doesn't even talk about whether, the, it doesn't even make clear whether they're talking about the death of a goldfish or a dog that's been your only companion for 15 years. So it's not clear what we're studying and the extent to which we can generalize. So even if there is something informative to be said about the neurobiology of grief per se, conceived as a process, its scope needs to be made clear what kinds and circumstances of grief are we referring to. And unless all of this conceptual work is in place, it's not just that empirical claims will be false, there's the risk of them not actually meaning anything.
Okay, you could say, let's sort of dust ourselves off a bit and say, what we need to do then is think about the brain process invo involved in brain processes involved in grief in dynamic terms. We need to look at something that unfolds over time and the various processes implicated in that. But there's more to be said here, because once we think of grief in this process way, it becomes apparent that the structure of a grief process depends not simply on what's going on in a brain following somebody's death or some other event. Rather, that process is very fragile. It can go in various directions, it can move in various ways, and the structure of grief depends on it to a huge extent on what we might call environmental scaffolding, and more specifically social scaffolding. And I'm using scaffolding in a fairly familiar sense here. It refers to how an environment organized and acted upon in order to change the tasks faced by one or more people. So grief involves environmental scaffolding, and we can also talk about scaffolding in terms of regulation. Um, in this context, at least, um, scaffolding can be regarded as pretty much synonymous with um, extrinsic or external um, mechanisms for emotion regulation. Now, there's been quite a lot of recent interest in how the concept of scaffolding can be applied to our emotional lives. So there's been some good work done, for example, by Lucy Osler, Joel Kruger, Hakim Stefan, uh, Giovanna Colombetti, and various others. So there are all these familiar examples. Um, you're in a bad mood, so you go for a run in order to calm yourself down and make yourself feel better. You go to your favorite cafe in order to feel relaxed. You put the music on in order to feel certain emotions. There are all sorts of props that we use to regulate our emotions, and we also use other people. And almost all of these regulatory opportunities are in some way social in nature, just given the ubiquity of the social in our lives. But what we need to recognize here is the distinctive way in which emotional processes like grief are scaffolded. What we see when we recognize what a grief process involves is that grief involves responding to a loss of a world that one took for granted, a world that we might have thought of we might think of as akin to a set of forest trails along which we previously ran, along which our emotions previously flowed. What's lacking are the various norms and directions and patterns that guided our lives, including our emotional lives. Ordinarily, our emotional responses to events reflect our various concerns um, and how those, how, how those events are relevant to our concerns. But what if your concerns themselves are in flux? What if the whole structure of your life is in flux? This is partly what people mean when they say, I don't know how to feel. I don't know what to feel. So all of that familiar, ubiquitous, <clears throat> scaffolding or regulatory structure can be disrupted. But this applies to the grief process itself. Grief is an emotional response to precisely the structure that would otherwise regulate one's emotional responses. So you've got an intricate, complicated process that's dealing with the reorganization of your entire life and your entire, the entire interpersonal relational structure of that life, but without the usual guidance and support that an emotional process would usually have. And... It's thus been remarked upon occasionally that grief isn't so much profound sadness. That's not what's central to it. Perhaps more conspicuous is this sense of utter disorientation, indeterminacy, feeling lost, out of place, no longer at home, no longer belonging, adrift, cut off from things. The world no longer tells you whether to do A or whether to do B. The very basis of your choices can be eroded. And indeed, in an interesting in a very interesting autobiographical account of spousal bereavement, um, the neurologist Lisa Shulman writes how grief involved waking up each day in an unfamiliar world where all the rules are scrambled. She goes on to say that central to, to engaging with grief is an openness to new possibilities, to becoming somebody new in certain ways. But then she does something that's kind of predictable but a bit, a bit disappointing. <laughs> 
uh, because it's a book by a neurologist and she's going to be talking about grief in the brain, she says, well, of course, in the end, all of this disorientation, it's going to be understood in terms of the brain, isn't it? Because it's all generated by a vast network of neural transmission and signaling. Everything's got a neurologic basis. And so this reflects in the end, a kind of irritating brain-centric calls that we find in other influential accounts of emotion. Now, I mentioned Paul Ekman a couple of days ago, and people didn't like him and said I shouldn't be citing him. So they might say the same thing about Joseph Ledoux and this uh, 1999 book, The Emotional Brain. But, you know, if you want to say he's not influential or credible, unfortunately the beggar's got 19,000 citations for this on Google Scholar. So it's clearly read and it's clearly noted and people take this kind of view seriously. But, you know, he refers to how emotions come from the brain, how the brain detects and responds to emotionally arousing stimuli, and how the brain makes us happy, sad, afraid, disgusted and delighted, as if you could reach into a piece, person's head, take out the brain, and there the brain is with its emotional life still buzzing, still intact, wholly constituted by these internalised brain processes. But if you think of a grief process in terms of this fragility, this disorientation, this lack of scaffolding, what we come to see is that a grief process is constituted by all manner of intricate interactions between the grieving person, or indeed grieving people, and their social environment. Grief involves not being able to rely upon, if you like, mundane forms of scaffolding to the extent that one's world is disrupted, but it can also involve the loss of what I call exceptional scaffolding. Normally, when something goes really bad, you run to the people you love for guidance and support. But grief can involve, if you like, in some instances, the loss of what you might call your principal regulator, the very person that you would otherwise turn to in circumstances of upheaval. So you're doubly disorientated. You're dumped in a wilderness without the prospect of a guide to get you out. So while grieving, one can... One, the way in which a grief process unfolds depends to a large extent on whether one can access other forms of scaffolding and the kinds of scaffolding that one can access. And what we need is a much more nuanced account of this. There are so many different ways in which a grief process is supported and regulated by interpersonal and broader social interactions. We can't think of how the process itself unfolds and hangs together just in terms of the brain. And then another, I think, very important, very big, wide-ranging theme is engaging in practices that involve confronting loss and revising the organisation of one's life. You don't just sit there until the world rebuilds itself. It essentially involves active engagement. Um, to experience grief, I don't think, is to be distinguished from actively grieving, if you like. And this is inextricable from all of these various ways in which we make sense of things with other people. Uh, we can co-construct co narratives together where sometimes these are ephemeral and regulate our interactions with other people, opening up other forms of support. Sometimes these narratives are retained, revised, further developed, shared, endorsed, serving as a basis from which to, to act and to interpret and <coughs> to engage with the world. There are also all the culturally established narratives and practices that we engage with. And I'm talking in a very positive sense about scaffolding here, but of course there can also be problems as well where you get narratives that conflict with one's experience but you sort of have to buy into, and there are all sorts of problems here as well. But there are many things one can say about narratives, and also about how narratives and trying to make sense of things serve to access other interpersonal opportunities which th themselves open up other forms of scaffolding. And then something really obvious but quite profound. Where you're really disorientated, it's not that you don't know what to do. There simply is no basis for your actions. The structure that was presupposed by your choices isn't there. Do I do A or do I do B? Well, the choice was made with reference to this project, which is no longer intelligible because it depended on that person. There's no fact of the matter as to whether you should do A or B. But what you can do in various ways is delegate certain things to those whose lives still have a kind of structure. So delegation is really important, and that involves forms of trust, and the presence or absence of trust is really crucial as well.
then something else that is very important to consider is so-called continuing bonds. So there's now burgeoning literature on continuing bonds, the ways in which we don't simply let go of the dead in all sorts of different ways, in different cultural environments. We retain attachments, connections with the dead that can take a range of different forms. For, and, and these can play a significant role in regulating our own grief, the kinds of emotions we feel. It's okay, I'm still with you, you don't need to feel guilty. I hate you, you did this to me. So, the, the kinds of emotion one's feel, one feels and the way in which one's grief unfolds can involve in various different ways these so-called continuing bonds. But of course, continuing bonds don't occur in a vacuum. The kinds of bonds that one can form and sustain depend on other forms of scaffolding. The ability to interact to access cultural resources, one's relations with other people, one's ability to go to places like graveyards, to interact with possessions, to reconfigure one's home. In all sorts of ways, these forms of scaffolding interact. Indeed, if we wanted to get complicated, we could talk about scaffolding for scaffolding for scaffolding for scaffolding for grief. Which is actually why I think the term scaffolding is a good one here, and why I'm inclined to stay away from labels like 4E, because 4E has a tendency to turn things into blamange, where the distinctions between mind, brain and world turn into a big amorphous pile of glob, whereas what we need here is quite a specific account of how various things interact and contribute to grief. Um, so I think this is, this is just a very broad sketch, I think, then, of the way we should go and of why it's thus problematic to think in more episodic terms. So this really does conflict with not all of the literature, of course, on emotion and the brain, but with a substantial body of neurobiological, neurolog sorry, uh, neurobiological literature and literature more generally that takes emotions to be brief, ephemeral, urgent responses to immediate situations. Grief isn't like that, it can't be understood in that way. But what it also does is it shifts our thinking about emotions more generally. If we take grief as an exemplar through which to approach emotional experience, we gradually come to see that more generally an emphasis on brief emotional episodes considered in abstraction from their place in a life omits something that's absolutely central to human experience, and that's how patterns of emotions and patterns of emotional experience involve discerning and navigating actual and potential changes in, the dy in a dynamic life structure. So I think it prompts us to rethink emotional experience more generally. And it opens us up not to static categories of ephemeral emotions, but to processes that involve the likes of dawning and sinking in, and strange forms of detachment and unfamiliarity and haunting. And maybe we could talk of avoidance and denial in these terms and certain kinds of acceptance. But it's the movement, it's the interconnectedness, and it's the contextualization within the changing fragile structure of a life that matters. So I suggest that we can rethink emotion in these terms, and more specifically, we can use this as a paradigm through which to think about the relationship between our emotional lives, the brain, and a larger environment. <laughs>